Welcome. Thank you for joining our Drive Electric Week virtual session, all in powering your electric car and house with Tesla Solar. I'm Aaron Choate, the president of Austin EV, the local chapter of the Electric Vehicle Association. Michelle Anselmont is a Tesla Solar roof owner and one of the event coordinators for the San Antonio Tesla Owners Group. She will present for roughly half an hour and then we will open the floor for questions. Feel free to put your questions in the chat and I will share them or invite you to unmute so you can ask your question yourself. Okay, Michelle, please go ahead and get started. All right, hello everybody. I'm uh, really pleased to be asked to do this. And um, the first image I just wanna explain to you is actually the back of my house. And you can see that that is actually the Tesla solar roof on that one side of the house. And it's on the entire roof, um, but that is definitely the, the back view there. So that's where the morning sun actually first hits my roof. And that photo was taken early in the morning just after, as the sun was coming over the hill to uh, go onto my solar panels. So we'll go to the next slide then. Okay, so the, the, normal, the normal question is, you know, what's in it for me? Why would you, why would you wanna do solar? And most people are like, what's the ROI? And I, I just kind of stole that kind of funny cartoon from the Simpsons there because, you know, once you put solar on your house, you're kind of like, oh man, there's a cloud. So I can definitely relate to that. But, um, you know, most people are like, well, it's a, you know, you're going to spend this additional money, whether you get panels or a roof, is it, is it really worth it to do that? So next slide. So, you know, I went through a list of things that I thought were my expected ROI for doing a solar of any type, you know, whether it's a roof or you do panels, but obviously, you know, the first concern for me was actually doing clean energy. When I got my Tesla, I was actually approached by somebody in a parking lot one time saying, well, yeah, you're running on electricity, but where is that electricity coming from? You know, is that coming from oil and, you know, and gas? Where, where is your energy come from that's powering your car? And so, um, you know, for me in particular, I, I definitely wanted to get into solar. And as far as choosing to do the solar roof, that was largely in part because I definitely needed a new roof. But, you know, here's an example in these particular images here of, um, there we go, um, the app that shows me how much energy I'm producing. And so I actually took these images uh, several days ago when I was putting together this presentation, but I just wanna kind of explain what these different images mean. So if you're not familiar with the Tesla solar app at all, and I'm, I know there's a number of different apps depending on what kind of solar you get uh, that do something similar, but in this particular case, you can see in the left image where the, the total bell curve on the top where it says 74.9 kilowatt hours, that's how much energy I generated that particular day. And it tells you where that energy went. So the green section is saying that that energy went to fill up my power walls. The blue is how much energy my house used the entire day. And then the rest, that dark gray is how much I actually sent back to the grid. Uh, and I am on PEC and that energy gets sent back to PEC. And then you can see on the next slide, how much energy I generated. Um, I'm sorry, Aaron, go back for me one second. Um, the next image, not the next slide. Um, you can see on the top, it's breaking it down by uh, month where that energy went. And so you can see you know, which months I sent more to the grid versus what I actually um, ended up using. And so in the last part, you can see that I have, since I've installed my solar, at least in the year of 2021, I didn't bring up since I installed, I installed actually late in November was my completion date. And you can see there that I have produced since that install more energy uh, than my home has used. So now, thank you, Erin, next slide. And then the next exp expected ROI, of course, is you want to reduce or eliminate your reliance on the grid. And, you know, I mentioned the 110% um, over, so 10% is getting sent back to PEC. 
But the most important thing there is you can see the number of backup histories I've had. And as I was preparing this presentation, I looked down to my app and I was actually gonna get a screenshot and I had not even realized that we had lost power for two hours that very morning. I was like, wow, it was so seamless when the power went out that I didn't even notice it. Uh, and, and so you'll see that. And you'll see, I get a, a lot of these little five minute jobs. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what's the root cause of those, but of course the biggest event that we had was the, the freeze that we had, uh, you know, both in January and in February, we had snowstorms. And so there's some backup events for those as well. And you can see on the image on the right is actually from the PEC app. And so the PEC app, you can see that I haven't actually drawn any energy from PEC uh, for these last two months. It only shows you the last couple of months, but it also shows you what you used the previous year. So you can see I, I used quite a bit of energy back in 2020, September of 2020, and then went down to drawing nothing from PEC. And below is an example of first, that's the first credit I got. So um, that, that does accumulate, accumulate over time. And so then if you have a month where there's snow or rain or whatever, at least with PEC, uh, I'm on net metering so I can take back that credit and use it and, and uh, prevent myself from getting a bill. Okay, so next slide, Aaron. So here's another expected ROI. So one of the deciding factors in doing solar is I knew that there was a tax incentive. And you can see what the tax incentives have been since 2017. And this is actually from uh, give the credit to solar.com. But this particular tax incentive that I got from my roof was, you know, a 26%, which was fantastic. I mean, that, that really helps in making a decision to do something like this for clean energy when you're going to get a, a pretty quick, you know, it's going to reduce the time it takes you to get your return on investment for putting this in. And the great news is that this is going to be going on for the next couple of years. So here we are in 21. And if you haven't done it yet, and you're thinking about still doing it, there's still time. You can still go ahead and do that. You got time till 22. Uh, there are a lot of companies that are doing it. I really love my Tesla Solar, and um, you know, I would say if if you're interested in doing that, it's probably good to start researching now and um, you know maybe getting in line so that you can get that really good 26% tax incentive. Now, there's always a chance that the the government will change something and it will be better or more later, but 26% is pretty darn good, and I was very happy to get mine. So, um, next slide here. Okay, so here's an example of solar panels. And so this is from Michael's roof. And you can see he has a, an 8.84 kilowatt solar roof, which is what's considered a medium size for a Tesla solar arrangement. And, you know, you compare this to the solar roof, you know, obviously just if you already have a roof and your roof is in good condition and you don't have to get it replaced, and you know, maybe with the hailstorms, you, you didn't want to wait, you want to get it fixed right away. Maybe you had a lot of damage or you know, with the, the snow and um, ice and things that we had. And that doesn't mean that you know, it's too late to do something. Obviously, panels is obvious a, a great option. And obviously it goes on a lot quicker than a roof does because they're just gonna assign those you know, in their particular locations. Um, and from what I understand, it takes one or two days. Uh, depending on if it could be a little bit longer though. So, okay, next slide. Okay, so here's, here's for specific for the solar roof that I have. Now, I knew what the specs were. You know, I expected that it was gonna be wind and hail resistant. So it has amazing specs, the warranty, and even with the panels, they have a fantastic warranty. Um, so those were my expected ROI on the specs. So next slide. Okay, so again, you know, with the roof, you usually do it. You don't just willy nilly do it. If you have a great roof that's not damaged, that doesn't need to be replaced, you might not do this. I really needed to replace my roof. Um, you can see that there was, there was some work to be done. There were some pieces that, you know, had to be replaced before they can put that underlayment on. And the right is a picture of this, you know, beautiful watertight roof, which uh, if you've, not seen the underlayment in person, it's pretty darn thick. It's, it's what I would consider like a run flat tire. It's very thick, it has a rubber coating, they peel it off. 
and then they apply that to the roof. And you can see they kind of did it in a shingle fashion there. And let me tell you, you know, nothing getting through that. Even when they put the nails in it, it, it has that, like I said, it's like a run flat tire. So when the, the nail goes through there, it kind of seals around those nails and makes it really watertight. And you can see what I had been putting up with. So when I say my roof was in bad shape, you know, I signed up for this and I had to wait because they hadn't done any installs in Texas yet. So I was super excited when I got that call and they said, hey, guess what? We're going to we're going to come out and put on your roof. I'm like, please, please come as soon as possible. So next slide. And then, of course, another expected ROI, um, you know, it, I knew it was going to look good. I mean, it looks it looks beautiful. Uh, I am so happy with it, you know, to come home and see it like that and know that it's it's producing clean energy and it's watertight. I'm not gonna have leaks or anything like that. It, you know, my garage is my happy place. No, Tesla didn't put the logo on the wall. I got that from Amazon. Um, I painted before they came. I had a whole plan. I put in the floor myself with a rubber mallet, you know, and a tile cutter. But when the guys came and saw, I mean, they they did such a professional job hanging everything. Uh, you can see that I have three power walls there and you can see the two inverters um, and the other equipment that's right there in the garage. So, and then um, that's a shot on the top there of what the roof looks like. Um, yeah, I'm super happy with how it looks and how it works. Next slide. Okay, so unexpected ROI. Uh, you know, right after I got it, I was just playing around with everything in the house. Everything, I would, I would turn things on and say, okay, how much does this use? I, you know, when the, the refrigerator would kick in and I could hear it kick it in, I'd look at my app, you know, and see, okay, is it time to replace that refrigerator? Have I included, um, you know, all the different lights that need to be LED now versus, you know, the old, um, lighting, you know, what can I do to kind of reduce how much energy I'm using? It almost becomes like a game. I absolutely love the Tesla app. And, um, you know, you can, you can see on the right there, and that's actually from Michael's. So you can, you can decide how you want to do it. So you can decide, I want to basically set it up that I'm going to be off grid. You know, I want to, I'm going to collect all my energy during, I'm going to power my house first. And then whatever is left over is going to go in my batteries and then anything left over goes to the grid. But what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to manage my use so that I'm never really drawing from the grid if I don't have to. And some people like to save the power walls just for like emergency purposes. You have a choice of doing that. So you can set your power walls any way you want. You can say, I want to set it. So I'm going to be self-sufficient with my solar system or I'm gonna keep those power walls in case something happens where I lose power. I know I have a backup and the house will never lose power. Or for the most part, you can do both, you know, because I, I never really run out of enough energy in my power walls because I do have three and I have enough of a backup. So that's something to consider if you're gonna put in power walls or um, any kind of solar system is like how much, how much backup do you want? When I first was um, looking at doing this, you know, I was almost, it was almost said to me, well, you know, PEC has net metering, so you don't really need power walls. Well, I would argue get the power walls no matter what, because you never know um, what's going to happen where you might not have that option to get something from the grid. And so on that image on the right, you see where um, there is, you know, how much is the house using? You see a little spike there where the car was being, you know, charging, it was drawing a lot of energy for a short period of time. And then you can see where the power wall is full and then the remainder of energy is being sent to the grid. Next slide. Okay, and so I really, you know, who knew, right? So like I get this installed in late November in 2020 and I would never, ever, ever have guessed that we would have experienced this kind of a snowstorm. And um, so he's gonna go ahead and play that for us, but you can see, um, you know, we had snow. Is it playing for you, Aaron? That one says that it won't play. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, I had a nice video. It was gonna wrap around and show you the roof all covered with snow, but you get the idea. There was snow and ice. So uh, next slide. 
And one of the one of the things that I did not expect, of course, is is because they're glass tiles with the solar roof, that that snow just slid right off. Um, this is the first snowstorm. So you know, it, people in the Austin area, you know, we had actually two two storms this winter. We had that first one in January we, where we had snow, um, and which was kind of fun, you know, and it wasn't as traumatic as Snowmageddon, which came in February. But, you know, it was pretty interesting to watch, you know, the snow would get to a certain level and then it would just completely slide off the roof. Um, and then it would increase the uh, solar production when there was no snow on the roof. But amazingly enough, it still produced solar with snow on the roof. And so what my understanding is, well, what my, what I do know is that the snow, the light is hitting those snow crystals and they're bouncing off each other and it's still making it to the solar roof. And then when those tiles warm up a little bit, then it just kind of helps it slide off even more. So next slide. So again, unexpected ROI. So, okay, so yes, I got a solar system because I wanted to be green and I wanted to be self-sufficient and had great specs and all these wonderful things. But I, nobody I think could ever have imagined that we would have gone through what we went through this past February. And um, you can see on the left, you know, the storm watch will kick in. And if there is grid power and, and you have not enough um, stored in your battery, it will fill for you. But the other thing of course, is that I was still producing solar. So what I, you know, I talked about using the app as kind of a game and this is the old app. These are shots from actually in the middle of Snowmageddon. But you can see in the morning when I first got up, you know, the sun was just coming up and I was still getting that 0.3 kilowatt on my solar panel covered with snow and ice. Um, and, you know, I, I'm like, well, at 0.8, let's see. Let's see how many things I, I don't really need to be running right now to get my use down to where I can be net zero. So the moment I hit net zero again and didn't have to draw with the power wall and I had um, you know, had unnecessary things unplugged, like, you know, my Roomba and things that really don't need to be running um, during something like this. Uh, you know, it was just really amazing how well the system worked. Next slide. And then, you know, the nice thing was, whoop, need to go back one more. There it is. So the nice thing too, is that, you know, because I was trying to reduce my use as much as possible, when, you know, as the day progressed and even more solar was being produced, I could then send it back to the grid and try to support my neighbors because there was a lot of brownouts. There was, you know, there was issues with power in the middle of all of this. So whenever I did have connectivity, I was able to send as much energy back to the grid as I could during that time, even though my, my roof was still covered with snow and ice. Next slide. And then, Another unexpected ROI. Okay, so yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's rated for hail. <laughs> and the first one that one, I mean, what are the chances? We had just such a crazy uh, first part of this year, but in February we had, I was like, oh, look, it's hail and the roof is fine. Those are the little bitty hails on February 5th. And then we had hail. So on April 15th, you, they, this was some hail. I mean, these are, you know, I, golf ball and larger size hail that we had was really kind of, um, I was like, wow. And the amazing part is, is just no, no damage at all. There was one little piece of metal flashing that was painted black that I saw a dividend, but it was just a dent. And to me, that's like a badge of honor. You know, the whole roof is fine, not a dent. It just gave it a super duper power washing and everything was fine. And uh, a pretty amazing, actually. Next slide. Okay, so some other unexpected ROI with the solar roof in particular. Uh, one thing that I wasn't expecting is I have a, a very efficient um, heating and cooling unit. And when I put that in the place where I have to change out uh, the filter, uh, the air filter is actually in the attic. And because they, they changed, one of the things that they did to get as many panels as they could on the roof is that I used to have some uh, perforations in my roof that were for roof venting. And they removed those, so they could get more panels on the roof, which is like, yay, light me up. And then they put a roof, a ridge vent on there. And 
It, the other thing is that those tiles are not directly on that underlayment that I showed you all earlier. It's actually about a half an inch to three quarters of an inch above. There's, there's attachment brackets that the tiles sit on. So it looks like it's just on the roof, but there's actually a little air gap there. And so when this hail is happening, the house is really quiet. The only time I hear the hail is when it was like coming sideways, hitting the windows of the house. So it's cooler in the attic. Um, it's quieter. It, it's really great. Um, very, very happy with that. And the other thing of, um, that I actually skipped over was the fact that because there's that gap there, that that really helped keep it cooler up there as well, because that black tile is not sitting directly on your roof. So you're not getting that heat transfer uh, directly to your roofing. Uh, next slide. Okay, so people are always like, well, how much does it cost? Is it expensive? You know, well, when I when I was looking at doing you know, this system, a lot of things are, you determine what you wanna do. You can choose whether you want a small, a medium or a large system. And so when they first came up with how much they thought that I needed in order to power all my devices, you know, they're gonna look at your utility bill and say, well, we think you need this. And I knew I was planning on getting um, a second electric vehicle uh, sometime in the future. And plus I, I wanted to really be totally self-sufficient if I could, that, that was my goal. And so I told them just, you know, every square inch that makes sense, let's not just do the dummy tiles because when you do the solar system, there's some where it's in the shade where they'll, they'll put a tile that looks just like the solar tile. They look exactly the same, um, but it doesn't actually produce solar. So I said, as much as you can put the solar on my system. Um, and that's the same whether you get panels or roof. They're going to ask you what kind of, how much size do you want on your system? And um, I know that I've heard that some utilities were putting limitations on that. I did not get that from my utility. They, they were not limiting how much solar. I know in some parts in the country, they actually, I've heard people do that. Um, and then how many power walls do you want? In, in my case, I got three. Um, Michael, who had had his, the uh, solar panels, he got two, and both of us say we wish we got another one because we really like the power walls. Uh, for the for the solar panels, you know, there if there is some kind of structural issue with the roof, there's a possibility that there's going to be a cost associated with fixing the section of roof where you want to put those panels. And um, in the case of the solar roof. You know, how complex is the roof? Is it a big flat roof or a lot of peaks and valleys and things like that? that that's going to determine some of the cost because it's obviously a, a roof with a lot of perforations and a lot of peaks and valleys. It's going to take more work to um, make it look beautiful and make it the way that you want it to be. And of course, how large is your roof? Uh, you can have a square footage on your roof. Um, you can have a 3,000 square foot house that's like mine, that's a two story or you can have a 3000 square foot house that's like a ranch style. And that's obviously gonna determine, you know, the cost in getting your roof done. And also, is there any damage? You know, if there's, if they, they can't see that, you know, when they're looking at your roof and they're kind of walking around, they, they couldn't, they couldn't see that I had, you know, a big gaping areas that needs to be repaired. So, you know, those are the kind of surprises that anybody has, you know, most people are doing this are replacing a very old roof. And so really the best thing to do is to get a quote directly from Tesla or from whichever provider that you want to use. Um, and they're going to tell you what they think. Then they are going to come out and do a site visit and look at what you actually have. Because a lot of times they'll look, um, you know, at, at some of the, uh, the views from overhead that are available. And then they'll come out and check out your, your, uh, your site and go in your attic and do things like that. And, um, and once they kind of get all that information, then they may have to tweak, you know, what they think it's, how much time it's going to take and what the cost is going to be. And that's just, that's normal business practice. I mean, you, you know, roofs are unique and that you don't know what you're going to get until you take off the old shingles. So, and I'm, I'm seeing a couple of questions pop up, Aaron. Do you want to read me some of those? Sure, I can do that. So um, one of the questions was related to um, the difference between your experience and the experience in Austin related to ROI. Uh, it, they have heard that Austin Energy works differently 
in a way that reduces ROI or, yeah. Well, I think, I, I know that there is been some modifications in the way that installations have been done. Um, and I believe that, and, and again, I'm not, I'm not an Austin Energy um, user, so I, I can't speak to it 100%. But from what I do understand, there was something where the energy had to go through their system before coming to your house. And so there was some kind of way that they were tracking it or whatnot. I do know that there is a, a go off grid function on the Tesla app now. And that allows you to, to not pull any energy through your utility um, to just you know, use your power solely. Um, and the only reason that I haven't actually done, I have it on my app, I haven't hooked it up. You toggle a little switch on your power wall and you connect it to your app. And what that does allow you to do is like completely be, you know, not sending energy back and forth between the grid. And the reason I haven't done it is because I generate more than I use. And I am quite happy to send that to PEC to get a credit. Now, it may be that Austin Energy is not providing that same type of credit that PEC is doing right now. Um, and that may be more an advantage for somebody who's in the Austin area because now you have that option to just completely go off grid and, and control your own energy which is another reason that you really want to get power walls when you're setting up a system, because having that backup energy and um, being able to, you know, control when and how you draw energy from the grid when you need to do so. Um, which you can I go ahead, can, you can go ahead and go to the next slide if you'd like to, Aaron. I'm sorry, we were uh, going to say, Aaron. I was going to say, as I, I have solar in Austin, so I was going to confirm that it is, it is quite different the way they've set it up to charge. They have a a separate meter that that uh, tracks your solar production, um, and then also they track your usage on the house, and then they they have a way in the billing to to credit you for the solar that you produced, and so it's not pure net meter metering, and it is it is more difficult to to make it make sense as far as um, installing batteries and so forth, as something other than a pure backup, which mm -hmm. these still work as a great backup. It's just, you really need to be deciding that, that you want it to be a backup um, in order to choose to go this direction, I think. Um, so well, next slide. Oh. Yes, next slide. Um, the, one, the one thing I would say is that I know there's lots of things going on with the utilities right now. And, and I, my hope is that Austin Energy is gonna kind of lean more to like what PEC is doing. Um, but again, I, I haven't had to do it, but I, I'm thinking that the go off grid function on the Tesla app is, is going to somehow impact that. So, um, you know, if, if, uh, Aaron, if you end up getting your power walls, you're going to have to let me know how that, that improved for you. Um, so the one thing I would say guys is that if you do, you know, I'm just going to explain this slide and then we can go through all the different questions, but there is a referral link that you can use as the only referral link that is still left for Tesla. They used to have referral links for the cars, the panels. The only one they have left now is the solar roof. And, and total disclosure here, if, if you use um, one of these referral links that are listed here, you're gonna get $500 off of that installation. And they also send us a, a reward for doing that. Um, with that being said, you know, when I first got my first Tesla, uh, you know, I, that was a good thing to have. I was happy to have it, but you know, for most solar roof owners, you know, it's, it's a nice to have, but not a need to have. Um, uh, but if, if anybody has any questions about that, you know, feel free to, to, you know, put it in the chat and I can explain that to you as well. But, um, I think there were some more questions to Aaron. Yes, one person was asking if painters can walk on the roof, such as when you need to have your chimney box painted. Okay, so that's an excellent question. So um, in that first picture, you'll notice that my chimney looks really great because <laughs> I made a point of having the guy go and paint my chimney before the, the Tesla guys put in the, uh, the solar roof because, and I'm not saying that they can't, the, there are special shoes that the roofers wear that because those are glass panels and if they get dusty or wet, they can be slippery. And there is special equipment that they use when they go up there um, and they do like 
chain themselves in and all this kind of stuff so that they don't fall off the roof and whatnot. Um, I actually had a satellite dish or on my roof before they went up there that I removed because me personally, I don't want anybody up there unless they're, they're wearing a Tesla hat or a Tesla shirt and, and they know how to do it. My, my biggest concern is I don't want somebody to underestimate how slippery the roof is and hurt themselves. And I also don't want them to damage anything. I don't want them to go up there and they drop a tool and next thing you know, you got a broken panel or something like that. And, and then you got to call Tesla to come out and fix it and it won't be their fault. So that's just my personal preference. I have seen many, many videos of Tesla owners going on their solar roofs and washing them. And I have not had to do that in Texas, by the way, at all. I have not washed my roof. I haven't lost any solar you know, power through dust or whatever, because we have these really good rainfalls here that just rinse everything off. Um, I know in California when they had some of the fires and things like that, and you know, there was like a layer of soot on everybody's house, you know, that I would call that extreme and that probably needs to be rinsed off. Um, but my my personal recommendation is get a really good paint, paint all the bits that are on top, and then try not to go up there if you don't have to. If you do, um, you're gonna get to know the installers very well. And they will, um, they will tell you who to contact and you'll have contact information of somebody who can help you. So like I had a couple of questions and I'm like, you know, I got to know all the guys, right? So I'm like, text them whenever I have a question or something like that. And, um, but for the most part, I, I'm not letting anybody on my roof and I'm not going up there either because it's slippery. And I, I'm glad it's slippery because you know what? That is gonna mean that all that debris when it rains is just going to rinse off and I'm going to have great solar. So, but great question. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and start um, asking people if they want to unmute and ask their questions. So Mike, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, I was just wondering if um, you thought about using the cars for battery backup. I guess you got three power walls, so you're probably not concerned about that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess in a way it naturally is. You know, worst case scenario, my car was full, you know, it wasn't 100% full because you usually go 80% when you're filling your batteries for the most part, unless you're going on a trip. But my car had enough energy. My three power walls were, you know, full when all this stuff happened. The longest, um, stretch that we had, single stretch that we had without power was six hours, six hours in a single stretch. And um, I didn't get below 83% on my three power walls. So I was never, never even came close to completely running out of juice. And again, that was partly because even the roof, the roof was still producing solar during the day. It was just amazing. I mean, I was like, wow. Really, wow! I, I couldn't be happier with it. And uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but currently, in order to pull power off of a car, one of the cars, we would need to use the 12 volt circuit to then generate power um, through an, an external inverter. Um, but one of the features of the new Cybertruck will be that it generates um, 220 and 110 right there in the bed of the truck. Um, so, you know, people are pretty excited about the potential of being able to use those for backup power in the future. Yep. You know, I did hear a lot of stories of people sleeping in their Teslas, you know, during all this stuff, you know. <laughs> I, I was able to stay in the house. <laughs> so. All right. So, um, Sigrid, do you want to ask your question? Um, sure. I wish all this technology existed six years ago when I invested in a, in a whole house natural gas generator. Um, mm -hmm. so, I, so I don't really need a, any power walls, but I would like to know how solar panels and solar roofs would work in a house that's configured like mine with a whole house generator and all. Well, I mean, if you have a whole house generator, you you only need to use it when you need to use it, right? Right. So you know, if you decide to go solar, see, that's one of the things, one of the things that I saw somebody um, making a statement about before was like, well, don't, you know, because everybody's talking like, is this going to happen again? Global warming, you know, what's going on? Are we going to have a snowmageddon every year in Texas now? 
Um, and one of the comments was like, well, I want to get a, you know, a, a natural gas or a generator or things like that. And I said, well, one of the things that happened in my neighborhood is that we had a lot of people that were on propane. We were not on natural gas because um, we're a little bit out. And so everybody has, you know, a propane tank at their house. And um, they were, even when they had energy and things like that, they still needed electricity to get their furnace to kick in. And they were running out of propane. And the propane suppliers were running out of propane. There was no propane. And the same people, I heard issues of, you know, natural gas issues as well. But um, with that being said, you know, because I was producing my own energy, I didn't have to go drive. I mean, people were going to get gasoline to, you know, power their gas generator that they were plugging in that was chugging outside, you know, trying to keep their house warm. Um, and, you know, the gas stations were running out of gas. I mean, it was like, it was crazy. It was madness. We all went through it. And so for me, it was really nice that it was already, it was already part of my routine. I didn't have to go do anything special. I didn't get, have to get any fuel. I didn't have to worry about running out of fuel. It just did its thing the way the thing was supposed to do its thing. So, and I use it every day, right? So I'm clean every day. I'm not just having this, this expensive external unit that requires fuel that I'm only gonna use when there's an emergency. And then what if, what if, something happens, you don't use it that often. What if it's not working? And then when you need it, it doesn't work because it's not something you're using all the time. So you might not know if it's functioning. I noticed um, Michael mentioned that it was two to three days to install the, the panels. Did, did you say, say how long the solar roof install was? Well, mine was a little bit different because I was only the fifth one in the state of Texas. And when the guys came, I don't know if you saw that last slide, I got them a little mini fridge and put the sodas and everything in there. Cause I was like, yay, y'all are here. And I love y'all. And um, I took really good care of them. And they were training a lot of staff at my house. So they, they stayed for a long time. I had five different crews there at my house and they were all learning. You know, they had the, the people that really knew what they were doing there to make sure everything was right. Um, but they were all, they were all super excited. They were as excited as I was. So we were all, you know, very friendly and good mornings and all this. And, um, and by the way, Tesla has a great safety program every morning. They sat in a ring in the lawn outside and did stretching exercises before they went on the roof. And, you know, they, they really got it going on. Um, but yeah, it, um, it did take, with what happens with the solar roof. So let me explain how that process is. At least today, solar, the, the roofing part is going to be from external contractors. So the company came out, they removed my really ugly damaged roof that desperately needed to be removed. And they were fixed any pieces of wood that needed to be repaired and there were quite a few. And then they actually installed the underlayment. And then you have another crew that comes in that is the power wall crew. And they're going to, you know, and you have the other crew that's going to do all the electric that comes from your normal electric box and it's going to run through where it goes through your house. So in my particular case, you know, they mounted all the equipment on the side of the house and they, you know, went up the side of the house and had to go all the way through the attic and run to the other side of my house where my garage was and drop the power to where the power walls were. And so there was a lot of running through the attic and stuff. And so that was all part of the, the electrician group that did that part. And then the guys that did the power walls who did an absolutely amazing professional job and it looked beautiful and they did it awesome. Were involved in the decision not to paint the conduit because it looked really good with the silver. Um, so yeah, they, they did all that. And then of course, then the roofing guys are another crew. And so they're the ones that jump on the roof and they're actually putting those tiles in. Um, putting the brackets in and, you know, snapping in all the, the solar panels and whatnot. So, yeah, it's a, it was a whole event. And um, I think because of the nature of mine, and I know it doesn't take this long now, um, it took, they were probably there for about, a, from the time that they were taking off um, the old roof to the time that, you know, they were done and said bye. I, it was at least a month, I think. But 
that you have to consider too is that if you're looking at getting your roof replaced, because that was that was the first that was part of the motivation, of course, is that I needed a new roof because it was in really bad shape. So once those guys took that that old roof off and repaired the roof and put the underlayment on, my roof was watertight at that point. So there was no issues of worrying about if it rained or whatever the heck was going to go on. And then, and then they essentially could take as long as they wanted to, to onboard new staff and train them and do it right. So there, there's no time limit on the putting on of the solar part of it. So. Does that, does that answer? Yeah, I think that that answered my question. Oh, yes. Um, so Mike had the, uh, he's asking, what is the total solar kilowatt? How, how much of the roof is actually solar in your instance? Uh, mine is a 13.5 system. So um, it was, I think when I first got the quote, I think they were going to, I think they had set it up for like, I think 10 and a half is what the original one was. And I came back and said, no, no, add more. Wherever it fits, put it on. <laughs> and so they're like, okay. And so then they changed it. And yeah, I, would, so I would probably point, have what's, what's considered the, a large system. What's that? At this point, what's the percentage of, of panel, like solar producing panel versus uh, dummy, dummy tile? Oh gosh, I didn't count all the tiles. Um, you know, I'm looking at it in my head. I probably should have put a slide on here. Apologies, everyone, for not putting a picture of where the panels were. I should have done that. Um, but I would say it's probably about um, probably about 65 percent of the roof coverage is probably solar. And I, I do have a chimney which I never use. And we didn't even use it during Snowmageddon. Um, and uh, there are some peaks and valleys that they are not solar because the way the sun goes over the house, you know, as it's passing over the house, it would be in a shaded area. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't generate any energy because of those little peaks in the windows and things like that. And so it, it didn't make logical sense to put solar there. Um, and that was the only reason. Well, they, they thought maybe they were going to be able to get 14, but as they were looking at it and everything, they're like, okay, 13 and a half is what we're going to get. Were they able to do that mapping remotely or did they have to do that on site with you? No, they did it. They did it remotely. Um, and so, you know, the first mapping they did remotely. And then I said, no, no, I want more. And then they did that remotely. And then he came out. Um, and I think, I think it was, 10 and a half. And then I think they said they were going to try to do 12 and a half. And then when he came out on site, he's like, oh, I think I can get you 14. I said, well, let's do 14, you know? And then when they started installing it, as they're going up the roof and everything, and they're kind of looking and they're like, oh, I think we're probably going to get 13 and a half. I'm like, that's okay. Just, it's awesome. Thank you guys. So, so there's right. a little bit, you know, every roof is different. That's the one thing you have to think about too, with the panels, you know, they're all the same size and they just stick them on there. When you're covering an entire roof with peaks and valleys and all this kind of stuff, it, every, every roof is a work of art. It, it takes a creative mind to say, okay, we need to make sure we put the tile here because it's going to slide over here. And then you want to have the valley and it has to look pretty, you know? So there's, you know, most people that are doing this, they, they don't want just the functionality. They want it to look really beautiful too. Mike's wondering if you can tell the difference between the solar panels and the non-solar tiles. You cannot. You cannot. They look, they look essentially, matter of fact, if you look at them up close, if you look at the solar panel, it, you can see like the little, like, I don't know what you want to call it, like divoting that indicates that there's solar, something in that glass. They were so smart. They made the dummy tiles with the same divoting. So from a distance, you cannot tell. You cannot tell between the solar and the not solar tiles for the glass. Yeah, it's amazing what they did. Is so it seems like it's it's likely heavier than than a typical roof. Excellent question. Thing? No. <laughs> you know what? Have you ever has it 
I don't know if anybody's ever picked up an asphalt shingle, but okay. So I had when before they could come out and do anything, I had to get some repairs done, you know, a couple of years ago. And so I had built this house. I had been in this house since it was constructed over 20 years ago. And I had left over, you know, shingles that I saved from the builder. So when they had to do a little repair, I'm like, oh, I have shingles in my, my shed. So I, I gave them the shingle. That thing, they're, they're bloody heavy. I don't know if you've ever picked, and they're small. So they're, you know, one of these Tesla things is, is pretty sizable. And if you took the same area and you weighed them side by side, I feel pretty clear that the asphalt ones probably weigh more than those glass tiles do. Um, and the underlayments on there, of course, too. But I, it seems to me like overall for the weight of the roof, it's actually lighter. Why would they lowball the solar tile coverage, such as uh, you know that you asked for more? Is is it a cost thing? Tesla gave us a proposal, but coverage with tiles is less than half of the roof. Um, I think they're doing it because what they're doing is they're looking at your current electric bill, and they don't want to they don't want to be like the used car guy. When you go there, you go to the Ferrari shop, and you're going to get the little Ferrari, and they're trying to upsell you to the big Ferrari. They're, they're gonna try to give you what they think you need to be kind of net zero is what they're trying to do. Um, but they don't know certain things. They don't know if you're gonna get another electric car or if you know, you're know you gonna have a larger family with more electric vehicles. you know. Um, and so because of that, they don't wanna just come in right away and say, look, you know, we can fit this much on your roof and it's going to cost this much when you might, and then you might be mad at them and say, well, how come you sold me this big system? I didn't need that big system. They'd rather sell you what they think that you need. And then when Michelle comes back and says, yeah, no guys, light me up. They're going to be like, okay, you got it. We can do that for you. I guess one of the other things they're trying to keep track of is like the, at some percentage of, of production, they're trying to make sure it's more uh, the most effective as it can be. So on, on various parts of your roof, it's just not gonna be cost effective necessarily. Exactly, right, exactly. So like when I say I got 65% are probably solar producing tiles, that's because you know the other 35%, if they put solar there, it, it, when, it would no longer really make financial sense to do that because there's gonna to be too much shade in those areas. If anybody wants to unmute, let me know and I'll, in the chat, just say, I have a question and I'll unmute you. If not, it sounds like our questions have ended. So I'll, I'll go ahead and close us down. Um, thank you for joining us today. And uh, where's the best place for our attendees to keep track of your work and, and the Tesla group? Um, well, there's several different uh, Tesla clubs in the area. We're, we're gonna be doing some uh, ribbon cuttings for some of the new chargers that are going up in the, uh, the Austin, San Antonio, Central Texas area. And so those are gonna be posted on the Tesla owners Austin and Tesla owners San Antonio sites. Um, and there's also, a, there's Facebook groups if you haven't joined those clubs, the best thing to do is to actually join the club. Um, you can look it up on a search and then you can, what they'll do is they'll then give you the links to join all the Facebook groups and all those different things. So. Great. Thanks so again. Very soon. We've got what a uh, supercharger um, that's just started construction in Round Rock. That's the one they're, they're just, breaking down, ground on now. Um, South Park Meadows is their broken ground on that. Um, what is the other one? There's the, the hotel, South Congress Hotel, I believe, is gonna be breaking ground on a supercharger there. Kyle has opened. So very soon we'll be um, having some ribbon cuttings for those. Uh, the Tesla Service Center is I think officially open now. And I believe that um, Matt Holm with the Tesla Owners Club in Austin is arranging some kind of fun there at some point. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but there's lots of exciting things going for, for EVs in the Austin area. And um, it's just a really exciting time to be part of all of it. Thanks again. Um, I just want to remind everybody that this is one of several sessions that we're, that we're doing for Drive Electric Week. We have one more. And so to see that, um, you can go to austinev.org and, and get the link to the, that one remaining session tomorrow. Uh, as we strive to make all of our local activities open and free to join. So all EVs and EV enthusiasts are welcome. But if you want to support our efforts, please consider joining the Electric Vehicle Association through the link that you will find on our site and select our group as your chapter. For as little as $35, you can help support our access to the core services we use to coordinate our event. Have a great Drive Electric Week. <laughs>